Shalom, shalom, everybody. Ardiel Bartit Sadok here from the Kosher Torah School, found online at www.koshertorah.com. Bringing to you right now, which for me tonight, our next lesson, our future lesson, or whatever lesson, <laughs> in the saga of Eliyahu Hanavi, the actual and authentic biblical teachings of the prophetic Kabbalah. And again, in this series, I am trying to show you the actual biblical origins of the spiritual practices that we know and observe, emphasis on that word, to this very day. And of course, when we use the word Kabbalah, we do not use it in the popular entertainment way that has become so you know prevalent in the past few decades. You remember way back when you had literal Kabbalah cults popping up, uh, not just here in the United States, but in Israel as well. Popular charismatic individuals uh, in the lead, uh, some of whom, unfortunately, in different groups, turn out to be pretty bad dudes. Uh, you know, it's not for me to judge or to make comments or certainly never to point fingers. You know, we never do that here. But this happens because of a certain simple and single reason. And that is, people put thoughts into their heads without putting actions or proper actions into their deeds. Now, if you remember, who is the highest of all the prophets? We say, of course, in our tradition, Moses. What is Moses' prophecy? The future, the afterlife, Revelations about the beginning and the higher revelations. None of that was the public focus. The focus, of course, we know, of course, what we call in Hebrew mitzvot or commandments. Now remember this. The Jewish religion, as observed today, is for Jewish people. Okay? That's who it's designed for. It is kind of like if you go to the department store. And you want to buy a pair of jeans. You go to the men's department, if you're a man, to buy a pair of men's jeans. And you will find the cut of the men's jeans to be different from the cut of the ladies' jeans. They're both jeans. They're both good. Technically speaking, you could, I guess, wear either one. But one is more appropriately cut than the other. Okay? This is common sense, is it not? When it comes to the observance of religion, I'm going to address this beginning here, a very, very important point. The laws and the commandments, the rituals and the observance of Judaism today were obviously designed for those people who are meant to practice the Torah path. Now, we define a Jew as one who was born of a Jewish mother or one who was converted in accordance to Orthodox Halakha. Ellie just turned off my air conditioner. It's going to get hot in here. I'll put it back on in a minute there, but that's okay. Why? I'll keep it on during class if it gets hot. Don't worry about it. All right. Remember, we told you no such thing as a distraction. I've been trying to get Ellie on the camera with me for ever since we've gotten married. But she doesn't think her English is well enough. She feels timid. She doesn't feel she's knowledgeable enough. Let me tell you something, guys, okay? She's probably more learned than half of the yeshiva students that I know. So that's right. So you know what, guys? You know what? Send emails, arielsadok at gmail, all right? Tell them. I want to see a thousand of them. I'm going to forward them to Robin Ellie to tell her that she has to come on camera. So there. Huh? So have the AC on. Fine. Okay, good. Thank you. You want her on camera. I want her on camera. Because she has, you know, sometimes I tell you about, you know, I have a student and sometimes you have this profound conversation. Well, usually I don't like to reveal it's It's, it's her. All right. We sit down sometimes at, at a Shabbat table and she reveals, you know, you know, I have this thought about stuff. And I said, ah, and then we go into, into some fun stuff. So, yeah, you know, Ariel Sadok at Gmail is my email. Send me all the emails. I'm going to forward them to her. Because I've been trying to twist her arm, but it's safe. <laughs> Remember, all right, 
Rabbi needs, she's young enough to be my daughter. She's tough. All right. Just before class, she was in the living room. Music blasting, weights out, pumping iron, kicking, you know, butt. Uh, she's the one who introduced me to uh, the ex-Navy SEAL, the motivational guy, Jocko Willick. Uh, a big role model example for her and, you know, something we espouse here. But getting all the way back to the Torah and the mitzvot. Ah, you think I lost my train of thought that I didn't. Judaism as a religion is for those who want to practice it. It's kind of that simple. Unlike many of my peers who believe they have a mission to bring all Jews back to religion. Well, I'm sorry. You know, I, I respect that. I honor that. But my view is rather Butlerian, you know, from Butler. Now, I'm going to say where my quote is from. It's from a movie which I consider to be one of the best ever made. But today has fallen, of course, into the political incorrectness due to the nature of its content. I'm talking about Gone with the Wind. Clark Gable, all right? Fantastic film. Uh, it really shows you the nature of of our previous civil war and probably you know what might not be such bad viewing for right now in light of current events to let people know for those of you who are pushing for more division and strife maybe you should see what happens when that occurs at the end of the movie after a long struggle hard relationship between Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara his wife he walks out on her and says, I've had enough of you. And of course she says, oh, what, what am I going to do without you? And she says the famous words, which of course shocked the audience back in the 1930s, what, almost 100 years ago, where he said the first curse word on film, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> because bottom line, you know something? I care about people. I really do. I give a damn about each and every individual. But at the same time, my concern and focus is that an individual find themselves, find their contact to God, find their connection, find their communion, find their way back to the ultimate truth. That is the biblical path. And that is the biblical Kabbalah. And that's what I try to teach here at the Kosher Torah School. So when I interact with many, many people who are born and raised Jewish, but who do not want anything to do with the nature of the observance of the religion. And I say, you know, son, that's your choice. I'm not out here to persuade you. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, okay? You can do what you want. Why? I'm not God's policeman, all right? No rabbi is. I don't give it any baloney. And whenever you hear of these rabbis who are wagging their finger at you, you're going to go to hell, this is going to happen to you, you're going to get this, you're going to get that, you know something, that's not that terrible. You don't see that anywhere. Is God going to punish the wicked? Why all, you know, gee whiz. And maybe we need more punishment in the world. I'm sure you've got a lot of wickedness out there. But what defines that wickedness and what doesn't? You know, halakha, Jewish law practice, is a very, very involved and intricate matter. And it's not just so black and white that you read from a book. And this is why all these people out there who call themselves rabbis who have not gone through the true Talmudic yeshiva education of learning the Shulchan Aruch and have a level of ordination which we call Yore Yore or Yadin Yadin. You know, I respect everybody. God bless you all. But that's not a rabbi. You need someone who really knows and understands the nuances of halakha. And I discussed this with my rabbinic peers, many of whom are dayanim sitting on the bit dins. We all know this. But that's the focus here. When it comes to the observance of mitzvot, what happens if you are not born of a Jewish mother or converted in accordance to an orthodox bet din court? Well, you want to know something? There are a lot of people out there who fall into this category. There are a lot of people around the world who truly feel an identity with, you know, Judaism. They will say it's with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the Creator. Well, you know, so everybody has a relationship with the Creator. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, where you are, how you are. Everybody does. And 
doesn't matter what religion you think or say you are, simply because what difference does it make? I mean, we're all <laughs> from the same source. We're all the same. That's what the Torah teaches. Remember in the beginning it says, uh, we're all created in God's image, not just the Jew, or not this one or that one, all of us. So we're all, we're all in the, quote, the bed t together in that respect. So what can I say? But there are those people who want to identify with Israel. So I'm going to tell you this. If you were born Jewish, you know what to do. Go to synagogue, talk to your local rabbi, join the community. Uh, obviously, at our present time of the COVID you know, crisis, uh, do things within the appropriate context of common sense. Common sense. You like that? It's not so common anymore, is it? Do not be so extreme to one end or the other. Do what's realistic common sense. That's the Torah way. Join the community. But what happens if you can't? Well, if you are associated with the community and you want to convert, if you want to be accepted in the Orthodox Jewish world, if you want to be accepted in the state of Israel, you have to go through what we call an Orthodox Jewish conversion. As opposed to the other forms of conversion, now don't ask me what's right in God's eyes. Right? Don't. I, I'm not God's spokesman. Oh, but you're a rabbi. Yeah, I know I'm a rabbi. I know Torah. I know stuff, right? But God, you, you, do you see here on my lapel? Do you, do you see here the little uh, the, the little insignia that God gave me from heaven that says I'm his uh, I'm his agent? Oh, 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 you don't see it? Gee, son of a gun, neither do I. What can I say? So therefore, please, don't put me up in some pedestal. I'm a scholar. I'm a rabbi. I'm a teacher. I'm here to teach you stuff. Okay? I'm not here to tell you what to do. If you want to get accepted in such and such a way, then that's the way you got to go. But a lot of people, I know, I, I deal with people from like foreign countries, you know, some who live in, in, in even in, in countries that are very hostile to Judaism. Let me tell you something. Proclaim yourself to be faithful to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just use that as a start. And then learn the best you can with what you've got available. And do the best you can. Is that acceptable in the eyes of the state of Israel or the local Orthodox community at large to be recognized and accepted by them? Probably not. But who cares? Bottom line is your relationship first is with heaven and God. If that's the direction of your soul, then take it. And if and when the time will ever come that you can embrace the community and that you want the community to embrace you in return, walk the path. It's really that simple. All right? But don't pick and choose and make believe that, that you are something that you're not. All right? If you're going to take upon yourself a commitment, then do it. Stick with it. Because that's what a real person of responsibility with all of this introduction, which, mind you, was not planned. All right? I never, ever plan my classes in any which way because that contradicts the very fundamental spirit of our kosher Torah school. Remember, many of my peers are out there and they're teaching rational, academic, book-based knowledge. Well, I've done that for years. If you want a college course, a university-level material, I've taught that before. I have courses on that. But if you really want to learn the biblical prophetic Kabbalah, which is something a little bit above the books, because it's not Bina consciousness, it's what we call Chokhmah consciousness. It's not intellect, it's intuitive. It's not rational, it's psychic. Well, you got to go with the flow. You got to experience it. One of those lessons like I've always shared with people is I do not believe in distractions. If anything happens, you go with the flow. We've had Sierra in here at times. She's distracted class. Before her, God bless Tex, may, may God bless him. All right, Ellie comes in. Doesn't You just go with the flow. And you, well, well, we like something a little bit more professional. Well, you want to know something? Then go watch television or a movie. All right? Oh, let's camera action. Here, you get the real deal. And if you like the real deal, then you've come to the right place. If you don't like the real deal, then you're in the wrong place. And like I said, my attitude towards you is butlerian. <laughs> you're welcome to come. You're welcome to go. Either way, I'm going to bless you that you should find your way in peace.
very in it. No fighting, no arguments, no distractions. Just go with the flow. If you can only understand that message, you will understand why the path of the prophet is called a nativ, which is a private individual path that no one else can walk with you. Like the wise words of Job, naked I came into this world and naked I go out. Because it's my path, God guides me. Carl Jung, the famous analyst. Remember Carl Jung? I like this guy. He's so cool. He tapped into the collective unconscious. He backed into, if you will, some of the deepest Kabbalistic truths. And you'll see, attached to him, like little dogs biting at the bat. Oh, he was an anti-Semite. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. One of his top students was, you know, Eric Newman from the University of Tel Aviv in Israel. All right. When Carl Jung had a heart attack, he had an out-of-body experience. Yeah, an astral projection, out-of-body experience. And guess who he saw? Jesus Christ, right? He's a Christian. No. Virgin Mary, Catholic? No. He saw Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai invited this Swiss German psychoanalyst, the Lutheran background, to the great chuppah of Teferet de Malchut. That's pretty progressive for somebody who's not Jewish. I know rabbis would cut off their right hand for a vision like that, and here Jung has it. And we talked about his soul and connections. He was connected. And so can you. I don't care who you are, what you are, how you do it. Don't talk to me. I don't care. Remember I said, frankly, my dear, stop looking this way and that way and this way and that way. I am this. I am that. I am this way. I am that. No, you're not. You know what? Just look up. Symbolically speaking. Look up. Be connected. Because you're never going to understand what we're going to read now in the rest of this class unless you understand the meaning of connection. Right here. We're discussing now, of course, the real close encounter that the Bible talks about. Real extraterrestrial alien contact. Now, how can I say such a thing in the name of the Bible? I've been asked that many a time. And I say it's real simple, please. We're going to deal with angels. And to the best of my knowledge, angels are not indigenous of our earth. They don't they're not from here. Right? They're not from in these neighborhoods. Right? They are not terrestrial entities which by definition makes them extraterrestrial entities. Now, I don't think they're little, you know, uh, green men or gray guys with big bulbous eyes, you know, flying around the flying saucers, the little ray guns zapping people. In all due respect, little gray guys, you know, with the, with the big uh, infrared eyes kind of stuff, they're not even from outer space. They're from Nishaya. Uh, go read my stuff about inner earth and stuff like that, and that's all there. Most of this, the in quote, Interactions that we have at the astral and physical is all inner earth based. And yeah, in all due respect, our governments know that and that's why they keep it all a secret. <laughs> so yeah, so if all of a sudden our connections go blank and all of a sudden you hear that I disappeared, wink, wink, <laughs> you'll know why, you'll know where. But that's curious because right here, listen to chapter 2, verse 1. Why he ba'alot Hashem et Eliyahu b'sa'ara hashamayim. It opens up. You know what? You can read the English. You don't need me to read it for you all the time. It says here, why he? At the time of the Eliyahu, that God is now going to raise Eliyahu Bisa'ara. What is a Sa'ara? It means a whirlwind, a storm. And I've been sitting there. I've, I've been breaking my neck all day trying to understand what is a Sa'ara and why is it necessary. Curious, it has curious uh, numerological connections, but that's besides the point. It's going to take him Sa'ara HaShamayim. It's going to take him up there. Okay. We have to ask some pretty basic questions here. Number one, And it was at the time. And we're going to read here. All right. I'm, I'm just going to read some things from the text. So what I'm going to comment is going to make sense within that context. Eliyahu says to Elisha, Hey, why don't you stay here for now? For God may, has, wants me to go to Beth El. Let's see where they're starting from. Right there up in the Golgal. Let's see exactly where. 
I gotta go to I, I, I gotta go to Bethel. Why don't you just hang out here? Now, Elisha, he ain't no fool, right? He says, as God lives and by your soul, I ain't leaving you. I ain't going anywhere today, all right? And they went down to Bethel. Now, why would Elisha be so intent not to leave Eliyahu's side? Because, listen to this, the sons of the prophets, the children of the prophets, who were in Bethel, come up to Elisha and say, hey, don't you know that today is the day that God's going to take your master from you? All right? And he goes, yeah, I know. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> It's a secret? How much of a secret is it? Let's read on. They, Eliyahu says, okay, now we're in Bethel. Oh, uh, you know, I, 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 now I got to go to Jericho. God wants me to go there. Okay? So why don't you stay, hang out here. And I said, uh, 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 you're a life by the life of God. I'm not leaving you. So they go to Jericho. So they're in Jericho. This is starting to sound like a, one of these, you know, like jokes. And the B'nai Nevi'im were in Jericho. Go up to Elisha. Hey, do you know this is the day that they're going to take Eliyahu from you? Yeah, I know. Shh. Who's? Shh. It's a secret. Apparently, everybody in Bethel knows. Everybody in Jericho knows. Right? And Eliyahu comes and says, all right, why don't you stick around here? I got to go to the other side of the Jordan. <laughs> I go, all right, I'm not leaving you. Shut up. I'm sticking with you whether you like it or not. So it says there that the 50 men of the B'nai went out and they stood opposite them from a distance. They see them both at the Jordan River. And, all right, apparently, they knew what was going on, too. Now, before we go on to splitting the Jordan about Eliyahu's men, let's discuss how, what kind of, what's going on here? Isn't this supposed to be like an unplanned event? Eliyahu knows that God's going to take him to heaven. Oh, we'll discuss what that means in a minute. But apparently, so does everybody else. All the B'nai Nevi'im, whether in Betta, whether in Jericho, whether standing by the yard then, everybody knows this is the day that Eliyahu's going. So now we've got to ask some questions. What do they know? How did they know this? Where did this information come from and what did it mean to them? Now, they're saying that they're taking Eliyahu. Now, here's the question. Did they understand or think that Eliyahu was going up to heaven and he was never ever coming back? You would think that based upon the nature of this dialogue with Elisha. But later, after he's taken away, they say to him, hey, maybe he got deposited somewhere in a mountain and in a valley. Let's go look for him. And Elisha says, nah, don't waste your time. But they insist. Why are they insisting to go look for him if they didn't think that there would be possibilities to find him? Understand now what we're dealing with. This is by modern definition. You might not like it, but it's true. Alien abduction. Because Eliyahu is being taken <laughs> and he's being returned. What do you call that? Well, he's not really being abducted. It's not like they're doing mind experiments. This isn't like the little gray guys taking Benny, Barry, you know, Hill. But I was about to say Benny Hill. Benny Hill is the comedian. <laughs> not the guy who was <laughs> taking Barney Hill. Sorry about that. Benny Hill, Barney Hill, Barney Rubble. You know, when the mind starts going, you get all that crazy stuff going. Don't get me started. I'm an old man. This is this is, this is is the Robin Eats business. Remember, I'm an old man. <laughs> I remember watching the original Flintstones when they first came out. The Honeymooners too. So, dating myself. But getting back to seriousness here. The B'nai Nevi'im knew something. How did they know it? It is implied that they didn't learn it from a book or a text or somehow an oral tradition. They were it's the key term. By modern definition, we use the word psychic. Like Jung taught, the collective unconscious, our prophetic traditions teach us how to tap into the, un the collective unconscious and making parts of it, connection with it, conscious. This is what we call hasagat ruach hakodesh, or the acquisition of divine inspiration. Some, in modern lingo, 
We'll call this tapping into the Akashic Record or whatever else. What it is is real simple. Using the uh, example of the old Greek philosopher Plato, he says, you know what life is like? Life is like living in a cave with your face stuck into the wall, not realizing that there's the opening with the light behind you and you can walk out and see the real world. Well, the Bene Nevi'im were trained specifically to turn around and walk out and see the real world. For those of you who may not know the history of our kosher Torah school, when we first began way back when in 1992, boy, time flies when we're having fun, we were called in our Hebrew name, Yeshivat Bene Nevi'im, the Yeshiva of the Children of the Prophets, based upon the wise words of the great sage Hillel from the Gemara Masachet Pesachim, which says, Hinach lehem Yisrael, Though we are not prophets, we are their children. And that pursuit for psychic connection has always been part and parcel of our Torah path. And we see this with the likes of our leading great sages, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Ishmael, and of course the legends of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And it goes down through history, through the generations. We have always had people who are what we can call Yorde Merkava, the people who were able to connect with this Merkava that we call from Ezekiel, but apparently pops up here in Eliyahu as well. So all of these B'nai Nevi'im, through their individual psychic awareness, know, see, foresee, remote view the future and say, this is the day our master is being taken from us. Taken from us. Okay. Where is Elijah going? Did you ever stop to ask the question? He goes to heaven. I, I, I got that. Where is heaven? Well, the Gemara is going to define for us the seven levels of heaven. You have the Vilon, you have the Zivul, you have, oh, I have all these different levels, okay? And you'll find Midrashim, which are stories. And of course, you will find the most famous of all the stories that Eliyahu ascends to heaven and is transformed into the Malach, the angel Sandalon, just like Enoch before him was translated into the angel Metatron. But, 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 Got to remember something, a point that even the Baale Tosafot, those are the commentators on the Gemara, when they saw in the Gemara a reference to Metatron and Enoch, they said, wait a second, how could Enoch become Metatron? Because the ancient teachings that, you know, centuries before the Gemara said that Metatron was the highest of the archangels, all right? He is associated with the Zeron Peen, and there's a whole bunch of stuff about him being so super special, about the super special Malach, that it became the foundation for many of the Christian ideas and beliefs to think that, in quote, God has a, a son. Why not a daughter? I don't know, but you know, we're going to challenge it, you know, uh, uh, theology right now. And it was always believed in the ancient times that Metatron was going to come down as a human being and he would be Mashiach. That was the ancient belief. I've written about this uh, in, in my book, Alien, Ancient, Aliens, Angels, and Demons. i got to remember my own book's name. And I, I wrote about this in my Torah portion, Papa Parsha, on, on Wayahe, which is, of course, the, the source of the prophets, called The Secret Soul of the Messiah. It might even be an essay available on koshutorah.com. If you go to, go to my website, check it out, put, type, type in like Mashiach or Secret Soul. Uh, it should be there. I, I Maybe, I don't even remember it. I've done, I've done so much stuff. It's been 28 years. Give me a break. You think I remember everything? Uh, I, I, I might actually have done a recording of it and, and put it on YouTube. Check it out. It's, it's up there with all of the, you know, academic documentations for those of you who like that kind of stuff. But okay. The Tosafot said, how could Enoch become an angel who already exists? The Midrash says that Metatron was with God in the beginning creation. 
But Enoch is a man who was from the seventh generation of Adam, which is kind of like later. So how could he be before and after? Oh, you're incarnate. Well, you see, this is the problem. You see, if the Christians really want to say that Yeshu was Metatron, well, then Yeshu was Enoch, which means that their Messiah was reincarnated, which is a concept that you know many in the Christian church can't handle. One time they did, not today. So you got all kinds of theological confusions about that. <laughs> Don't look at my stuff online. I'm not going to go there right now. But anyway, Eliyahu follows in this footstep and is transformed into a, in quote, heavenly being. But what the blankety blank does that mean? Where is this heaven? Our understandings of other worlds is a wee bit more sophisticated than just some nebulous mythology of somewhere over the rainbow. That's where heaven is. And probably the munchkins and Oz and the wizard and the wicked witch of the West, if you believe in that kind of silly stuff. But now let's get real. Where did Eliyahu go? Where did this chariot come from? Okay? I didn't get to the point about the chariot. He's being taken away. These guys were convinced he was coming back. Apparently, Elisha knew better. Where was he going? Okay? Now, I am not, hear me now, I am not saying that the chariot of Ezekiel was a flying saucer and they were taking him to a foreign planet you know, out in the Pleiades, where you can hang around with those big, tall, blonde-haired, you know, alien chicks, uh, you know, uh, doing all kinds of peace weird woo-woo stuff that you see, you know, in the, the videos on YouTube. <laughs> all that crazy stuff. All right, let's get a little bit more serious, please. Was he going interdimensionally? Was he going extraterrestrially? I don't have that answer for you, for you. But I will tell you this. Based upon our knowledge and experience, remember, Eliyahu comes and goes all the time. Remember what our traditions teach, that Eliyahu Hanavi is present at each and every circumcision on the eighth day of a Jewish child. Now, in case you haven't noticed, there might be a lot of circumcisions on uh, that day, some of them even overlapping, so how can you have Eliyahu at each and every one? Man, he must be getting around really fast. Now, of course, you're going to be rational and you say, it's only a symbolic metaphor. Yeah, that's true. But it's something more than that. You see, the symbolic metaphor in psychology we call an archetype, a general symbol which has universal meaning. But as a point that Jung understood and the Kabbalists before him also knew, there are what we call the uh, archetypes which are autonomous, which means that they are themselves alive. You see, when Eliyahu left our earth, he became something more than just a finite human. We read throughout all of our traditions about the appearances of Eliyahu, in and out all the time. He's going to come back before Mashiach, as we know from the prophet Malachi, right? And what's his job? To reunite stuff. That's what his job is, just like what the Torah is all about. So Eliyahu is alive. He never died. And you want another curious little uh, coincidence here? There's an old Midrash that states that in 586 BCE, on the ninth of Av, in the afternoon, a Jewish mother from the house of David gave birth to a child. And that child was abducted and taken by its mother, from its mother on that day. Taken to a special place called the Bird's Nest in the Garden of Eden. And there was raised. And this child will return to the Mashiach. So we said Mashiach was born before the temple was destroyed. Not the second one, the first one. Sorry, Christians, I know you want to associate with that. So, if this is the year 2020, and Mashiach was taken in the year 586 BCE, that would make Mashiach today, 2000, 
800. <laughs> 2,900 years old. He's an old guy. He's been around. Where is the bird's nest of the Garden of Eden? Ah, for those of you who know your Zohar, inner earth. Everything always revolves around the inner earth. Whenever you start looking up, you start looking down. Now, is any of this leg uh, uh, literal? Is Mashiach actually now almost 2,900 years old? and probably in the body of like a 30, 40 year old guy, and he's been trained and educated in inner earth by all those entities and everything else who we call the inner earth angels, the watchers and the like. Who knows? Where did Eliyahu go? Well, we don't know yet, now do we? But just in case you want to wax rational, let's continue reading here this chapter. So, they come to the Jordan River, verse 8 in chapter 2, right? Eliyahu took off his aderet, his mantle, okay? His, 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 his robe, all right? And he rolls it up and, and hits the water with it, and the water divides right and left. Slick stuff like Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Part in the Red Sea. How did that happen? Unlike at the Reed Sea where you had the winds blowing against it, none of that happens. He takes his thing and bam! That's a pretty slick trick. What? How did it happen? Well, you know, it's only a story. It's only symbolic. No, no, no. According to this, it's legitimate. It's literal. And it really happened. How did it happen? The same way it happened when we're going to read later about Elisha giving the blessing on the little thing of the oil and it poured out a whole bunch of oil. It was the manipulation of material matter by the psychic energy within it. Material matter, as we know, is very rigid within its atomic structure. But within that atomic structure is energy. Oh, you don't know that there's energy in atomic structure? Try opening up a little atom and seeing what's inside. And you know what you get? Boom! A nuclear explosion! The psychic mind taps into that energy. And instead of ex opening up the atom and causing nuclear explosions, can manipulate maneuver that just like you do in a dance, in a trance. And you can change the course and shift of matter. All in the game knew this. This is part and parcel of the expanding of the mind. For those people who excel in psychic abilities today, whether it be telekinesis or any of the other kinds, they're not gifts. They're just powers that people learn how to develop. Our governments know this. This is why they put the kibosh on it. This is why they put the whole thing out in the, in the big social world. To keep people away from it. Simply because they know too much power in the wrong hands is going to mess things up. So it's a grab. Real simple. They know it. And I can say it because I know no one's going to listen. Uh -huh. Okay. Eliyahu had the ability to literally manipulate the force behind before him. And so they cross to the other side. Now Eliyahu says to Elisha, all right, the gig's up. Everybody knows what's going to happen next. All right, he says, all right, what, are, what can I do for you before I'm taken? What, what's, what, what's the last thing I can do for you? You're my best student, all right? You are now going to pass on the link of the chain. Give me one thing I can give to you. So what does Eliyahu, what does Elisha says? What? Bait seed, as we'd say in Hebrew, all right? Let me have a double portion of your spirit. Whatever power you got, I want twice as much. <laughs> that takes a lot of, you know, what to ask for, right? However strong you are, you can bench press 200. I want to bench press 400. Whatever you could do, I want to do twice as good. So, <laughs> that's pretty slick. I shot that. That's, that's, that's not easy. All right? And he says, all right, this is the deal. If you see me, you're taken, then you're going to get what you want. But if not, then you won't. Okay? And it was that they were going, walking and talking. Behold, a fiery chariot and fiery horses, and they separated them both. And Elijah ascended to heaven in the whirlwind. All right? And Elisha says, my father, my father, etc. Okay. He did see it. 
So what is the relationship and the association of what Eliyahu said to what happened? All right? If you are merited to see it, that's a sign that God approves of you and he's going to bless you. That's missing from the text. Don't you interpret the text like that. What Eliyahu was saying to him, if you think that you have the ability and the power to receive what you want, then you better be a receptacle open enough to recognize and see what's about to happen. And if you can do that, if you can be there and to be the Beit Kibul, the conduit of reception, because when this vortex opens through which I'm going to go through, you got to be able to suck in that information, that energy, and absorb it within yourself. And if you can do that, then you will have the conduit, double the amount of what I have, whether it's actually double, one and three quarters, two and two thirds, who, you know what? Don't get into little picking details of silliness, right? If you want something, like we learn later with the, with the little thing of the oil, if you want to receive, you gotta be open to receive it. And remember this. Now, this is the big lesson here. All right? Every one of you, I think, needs to learn this. Do you know the greatest obstacle, the greatest satan that you face? Now, don't go looking out there. Don't go looking for the devil who doesn't exist. Look in the mirror and meet your devil. Meet your worst enemy. It is you yourself that holds yourself. Part and parcel of the prophetic traditions is boundaries. Boundaries are only the what we call Arba Amot of Halakha that God gave us. The boundaries of Halakha and proper practice. Everything else, the sky's the limit. Your mind needs to be open. Your intuition needs to be fluid. And this is why how I teach here at our Kosher Torah School to try to break you of all this rigidity. So this is why, for example, when distractions come, I tell you, it's not a distraction. Don't go looking at we're here and that comes from the outside breaking. There is no outside and inside breaking. It's all part of the whole. See the, and go with the flow. And if you can't see that because you can't emotionally accept that that's a reality, then you haven't learned your lesson yet. When you have problems on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't like it the way it is. It's got to change. Oh, really? Well, I have long told individuals, you know what? You got to learn meditation so that you can ascend to heaven. You stand in front of God's throne. What you need to do is wag your finger at God and say, you don't know how to run a universe. Get your, you know what, off that throne. I'm going to take over. I'm going to show you how to run a universe. How many people, they don't want to say, God forbid, I would never think like that. God forbid, I would never speak like that. But how many deep down really believe? They can run the world better than God. They're going to tell God what to do. They're going to show God how things are supposed to be. <laughs> the hubris and the arrogance. Remember the Genesis 6? You had those malachim, those angels, who came down from heaven and said, look, we got to fix what got broken. And they thought they could take the pressure of the vibrational energy of physical form and that they could tolerate it and exist within it. And God do that. You can't handle it. And I said, we're going to show you that we can. Well, they were wrong. So, go with the flow. Wise words of Pirki Avot, which is all Kabbalah. It says, nullify your will before his will, so he'll nullify the will of others before yours. Remember what will is. Will is the Keter. And I, it's Malchut. I, Keter, will, right? I, will, will, I, center column, moving with the flow. And it's because the Beninivim, we are their children, were trained in these ways. They could see the past, the present, and the future. They all knew what was coming with Eliyahu. And here now is Elisha. He knew darn well. Why didn't Eliyahu want him to come with him to Bethel, to Jericho, to the other side of the Jordan? Maybe he doubted whether Elisha could really handle the open influx of that energy. Let me tell you something. Vortexes. Let's talk about that for a second. 
openings in dimensional planes where you can literally go from one plane to the next. Some of them are natural. Others are open through tonal technologies. I have heard legends from locals that we have places like these right here in our Tennessee woods. Certainly the cave in Hebron is one of the natural ones. There are places on the Mount of Olives and on the Temple Mount and in places all around the world. There are places in Utah, which I won't discuss. There are places in, in Nevada and South America and in Asia and every one of the older traditions, certainly up in the Himalayas, the, 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 the entryways to Agartha and the like, all of it is there. So when you hear about things like Bigfoot popping in and out, well, they're not living up in a cave somewhere. They're po are probably popping through the vortex, maybe even unknowingly. Because you could be like in a cave, right? The vortex, you know, these are all over. They're just anomalies of magnetism. Probably that's what's going on in the Bermuda Triangle. And, you know, these things are there. And like I said, they can be open from that side or from our side, like a door. When we use specific types of shamot and meditations, we open them. Do we walk through these vortexes physically? Usually not, but you can. That's the secret of what we call kvitzat haderech, shortening of the way. And we've talked about that in previous classes. And again, go to YouTube and put in, uh, you know, kvitzat haderech. I think you'll pop up. You'll find the videos there. But anyway, most of our travels are astral. But sometimes they are physical. Now, how do you get from point A? This is something that most people don't understand when we're dealing with other entities. Remember something about those who we call angels? They're not God or gods. They are not omnipotent, all-powerful, and they're certainly not omnipresent all, in all places. Angels, they got to get from point A to point B, just kind of like you and me. No, they're not like good old cool rabbi here who rides a Harley. So I don't think I'm going to find, you know, the uh, heaven's angels you know, motorcycle club or, or Merkava club as the case may be. But somehow, somewhere they're getting around. Now, what the heck is a chariot and a horse of fire? Do you ever see chariots and horses that go like flying up into the sky? It reminds me of, like the closing scenes of like those old 1960s Hercules, Sons of Hercules movies, you know, the dun the dun dun the dun the dun I don't know if many of you were even remember that. That's, again, dating myself, the Sons of Hercules stuff. But that's what we grew up with. But anyway, that's what it reminds me of. You know, this old, old stuff. And what really was a chariot or a horse of fire? Oh, it was a flying saucer. Where do you get that from? It was obviously some me method, some means. Why a fire? Indeed, some of the commentators question, say, okay, Eliyahu is still flesh and blood. How does he walk into something of fire? What happens? Okay, yeah, think about it for you and me. Um, you and I are going to go somewhere. So we're, I'm, I'm going to pick you up in my car, my truck actually, and my truck is on fire. Hop on in. <laughs> you get burned up. That's not a very smart plan, is it? No, it's not. When we are using the words chariot and horse and fire, we're obviously referring in a context of terminology which made sense 2,700 years ago. Which if we were to have witnessed today, I'm pretty sure we would have seen it in a different light. What exactly was the vehicle of transportation? We don't know. Where did it come from? We don't know. Where did it go? Equally, we don't know. But how curious that it states it came in a whirlwind, a sa'ara, a storm. What, what do we need a storm for? Why can't it just come out of the sky? Dun, 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 dun. 
you just go back up, you know, and have the nice old Sons of Hercules theme song playing in the background as you're watching Eliel go up to heaven. Kind of like, you know, like, like what Hercules did and all the rest. Why a storm? That's how you know that this was never meant to be understood symbolically, but it's literal. Because for the Beninivim, who create the vortexes, they would recognize the nature of the meteorological disturbance that is created when these vortexes open. This is what happened at Mount Sinai. Go back and read what it was said at Mount Sinai. The whole place is shaking, smoke and stuff. It was very stormy. And if you remember, Eliyahu in the cave had the experience, again, all of the klipot, but he was going through the vortexes psychically, uh, astrally, and he is, again, disrupting physical space. This happens every single time that a vortex opens. So Eliyahu clearly was taken somewhere interdimensionally, extraterrestrially, I don't know. Because he's always back here. So let's say, for example, all right, let's speak with a little bit of silliness, that he's taken to the Pleiades and he's hanging around with those blonde-haired babes up there in the Pleiades, and he has to come back here every day for a Brit. Darn! That's going to be a real busy travel schedule, isn't it? Hanging out there in the Pleiades, oh, ugh, 9 o'clock, i, I got to be at the Brit in Yerushalayim, and then i got to be at the one in London, then i got to be at the one in Paris, then i am going to be at the one in Los Angeles, then I'm going to be at the one in Mexico City, ugh, running around. Okay, he's got a busy day, and he doesn't get off a of Shabbat either. Now, I think that would preclude him being up hanging out in the Pleiades. So where is he? question is, what is he? Is he human like we are now? Remember what the future holds. We say the rewards of the righteous in the world to come. We all ascend and inherit worlds. We become watchers in our own way for the younger races, if you will. Well, that is where Eliyahu evolved to. So, we associate Eliyahu with Sandalphon and, of course, Enoch with Metatron. But we associate the two of them, Metatron and Sandalphon, as the two cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, the male and the female. We correspond, or correlate, I should say, them with the angels called Ophanim and Hayot. Well, this is all connections here, because Eliyahu, like Enoch before him, ascended and became part of a collective consciousness. And the Kabbalah says that his body never disintegrated, but they, in quote, like, parked it somewhere. And every time he meets it, he will, from that higher dimensional consciousness, inhabit the vessel of his body, which he can then shift and shape into any size, shape, and form. He's the original shapeshifter. This is the higher dimensional entities of whom we are dealing with. We can call them shapeshifting aliens, or, as the Bible would call them, angels. This was Metatron and how he could become Mashiach, if you believe in that kind of stuff, or how Eliyahu comes and goes. And that is what Elisha witnessed. He saw this, not only with his physical eye, but psychically, intuitively. His energetic connection with Eliyahu was not broken by the disconnection or separation of physical bodies, because souls are connected energetically. And it is, use the lack of a better word, a sexual thing. No, not that Eliyahu and Elisha were sexual to one another. No, of course not. But the word sexual is libido, energy. Center column, keter, dot, eret, yesod, malchut. Okay? Libido energy is the creative force. It's the psychic energy, the chi, the orgone, the prana, the kundalini. When you get immersed energetically, right? You don't just separate. There's a bond there, a bond of souls. So even though Eliyahu's body was parked, whereas conscious Elisha is still tapped into that. And you know who is like this to this day? Chaim Vital. 
Chaim Vital is the redactor, of course, of the Lurianic Kabbalistic tradition. He studied with Isaac Luria, the famous Arizal, for only about two, two and a half years. Arizal died at a very young age. Chaim Vital outlived the Ari, gosh, by almost 50 years, I think, ballpark. Uh, I think it was over that. And in all of those years, he wrote, obviously, his great encyclopedic works, which are very profound lessons of psychology and inner understanding. As such, Reb Chaim, if you read, you read Kiperi all the time, he says, uh, the Ari taught me, and my teacher said to me, and you read in books like his autobiography, where he confesses. Many a time, the Ari comes to him after he, he passed, and comes to him in his dreams and his visions and teaches him. Now, psychologically speaking, well, maybe that's just a projected archetype of his unconscious. Maybe. Or maybe that was the higher consciousness of the Ari, which is reabsorbed into the greater Knesset Yisrael, as the Zohar calls it, as such, can then take on the form of his old body and communicate with Rab Haim in that way. Is that really different from being an archetype of the collective unconscious? But of course it is. What is this psychic mumbo-jumbo and this is psychological reality? Uh, you know what the realism is? There is no difference. Psychology and psychic are one and the same thing. It's one and the same word. What you want to call a symbolic and metaphorical is real. And you will know it internally by the nature of the psychic phenomena that you experience when you practice the biblical prophetic traditions. Hey, which what, what we teach here. You get it? You're following along? This is how and why Elia, Elisha was able to see Eliyahu. He was still connected. But he saw him no longer, as it says. Right? Body is gone. Okay? So, he tears his garments, which is the traditional thing. My teacher, my teacher, where have you gone? And he picks up this aderet, this mantle of Eliyahu, which itself is charged with psychic energy. It has the power to do miracles, just like the staff of Moses before it, and just like Elisha's own staff or mantle after it. We charge specific things with psychic energy. Ah, you know what? We're going to go over a little hour by a few minutes. Deal with it. When you go to a real tzaddik, a real master who understands and knows what he's doing, when he wants to project positive energy to you, it's not like a song from the old play, A Fiddler on the Roof, a blessing on your head, mazel tov, mazel tov. If you like that kind of stuff, go see the movie. But someone who really knows what's going on and how to do it, they will take something whatever it is, however small, however great. And through the focus of projected mind, they project into it the psychic energy. And that entity, that item becomes charged. It can be charged this way for good, for blessing, or charged for evil, for a curse. So sometimes you can have an item that came to you from somebody or something that you feel you don't really want to be connected to anymore and you get a bad vibe from it, that vibe might not be make-believe. Get rid of the item. Burn it. But if you get something good, bracha, kadosh, you embrace it. So, this is why, for example, we wear the talit and the tefillin. And go on kosher Torah, see, I didn't write the article, but someone else did, I put it up there, that the tefillin actually tap into the uh, acupuncture meridians. And you can wear them. And it creates energy and it fills you with energy. And that energy becomes real when you tap into the inner psychic flow, which flows through it. So everything that we do becomes a conduit for the flow of the energy. This is how we connect the higher and the lower worlds, what we call in Hebrew, Yehud. This is how we do it. It's not a theoretical thing. It's an actual practical thing. So uh, uh, Eliyahu's mantle had power. If you were and I were to find it today and possibly put it on someone who's like dying of cancer or COVID, it could literally 
charge that individual with enough psychic energy, chi, raw, pure kundalini energy, that literally <laughs> knock it all out. Yeah, that's real. And it can, and it does happen. Wouldn't you like the ability to charge your own talit to make it like an adherent of Eliyahu? Dramatic pause for you to digest that. You can. Everybody can. But you got to do it the right way. How? You're not going to listen to me, so why bother? Anyway, let's move on. So he takes the mantle of Eliyahu, strikes, of course, knocks open the, uh, the, the uh, whatchamacallit, uh, the Jordan River, goes back, and everybody says, what happened to Eliyahu? All right? <laughs> and they could say, oh, wow. Elisha just split the sea just like Eliyahu did. He's got the power, man. He's not a new boss. Meet the new boss. Same as the old boss, but in this case, in a good way. So they say to him like this, verse 16. All right, we have 50 able men. Let them now go and search and seek your master. Perhaps a wind from God carried him off and throw him on one of the mountains or he's in one of the valleys. <laughs> Did everybody know he just went up? What's he hanging out in the valleys and the mountains for? Again, because they understand that which we call alien abduction. When you are of the Beninavim school, you make contact with these other entities. And they're not going to physically take you away. But in astrally, you do go places. When you go look at all this alien abduction stuff, read Jacob's book. Okay, Most of these people have actual alien abductions. It's all astral. It's not physical. Because that is the nature of the inter, inner, interdimensional reality of which we deal with. So, Bene Nevi'im are always ascending through the different palaces that have to pass through the domain of the Klippot. And because we are properly calibrated, we're granted safe passage. Whereas those who are not properly calibrated with Kiddusha holiness, they go into the domain of the Klippot and automatically they go to every which way. So we ascend, we go through what's called the seven doors. And of course, the mystery teaching is the first of the door lies in the east. It can be seen where it is not, which is a symbol, of course, of Yasod. But when you go through the in quote doors and you experience the Merkaba ascent in the astral, you don't look at your body like glittering, glowing like Master Yoda or Obi-Wan Kenobi. You see yourself physical just like this because you're in that dimension. That's just the way it is. So, the B'nai Nevi'im were convinced that these entities who had taken Eliyahu were going to deposit him back somewhere. Why? Because apparently that's what has always happened in the past. It's happened to Eliyahu in the past. It's even happened to them. So don't be so quick when you hear about people having alien abductions to say, oh, a bunch of nonsense. Well, not so sure. Not so sure. Because I don't look at what alien abductions today say. I go back into the writings of Rabbi Yehuda Fatiyah, Rabbi Yehuda ha ha Hachatzid from the Sefer Hasidim, uh, books like the, the Tzifuni uh, uh, on the Torah and Tzifuni Tziuni, old classic Jewish literature, which speak about interactions with earth spirits, fairies, elves, and the like. How many of you read my book, Protection from Evil, about my personal interaction with uh, entities out in the woods? I wrote there, and I'll say it again. It might have been a dream. It might have been all in my mind. But it's very, very real to me. That is how this stuff works. Elisha concludes and says, don't go looking. He's not coming back. That's just the way it is. He has transcended and ascended above. And they said, come on, come on, let's go look for him. So finally he says, all right, go find, go look. They looked. They didn't find him. <laughs> so, then there's a whole thing about Elisha showing the power, how he has to heal things, cure things, and correct things. And then, of course, at the end of the chapter, something we discussed in our previous chapter about respect. Remember the kids? 
you know, messing around with the kavod of Elisha, his honor and respect. Hey, boldy, boldy. Mm -hmm. Boldy, boldy, huh? What happens? Zap. Notice that he didn't call down fire from heaven. He cursed them. He sent out negative energy upon them. And nature, the universe, reciprocated. And just so happens that two bears were there and mauled the children. Son of a gun. Bears are not very indigenous to old Israel. For them to have even been there at that time in that way. Hmm. Don't ever underestimate the power of positive and negative and real energy. This is the secret of the children of the prophets. This is the greater reality of the world in which we live and which we endeavor to experience, harbor, and master. Because that is our destiny and purpose. And that is why Eliyahu is here with us, right here, right now, everywhere. Doing what? Doing what his job is. To return the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Reconnecting. That's what we're all about. And that's what we're here to accomplish. So, this is the great secret of Eliyahu's ascent. It was a real close encounter of the most profound kind. And for those who experience these things personally, our way of making appropriate discretion and being able to discern what is true, what is false, good and bad, from all those people out there in the ET community who have all these experiences. No, my dear friends of Prometheus will never allow me to talk this way on their program. <laughs> it's, not, it's not their agenda. They, they kind of like what... Uh, Eric and Nick and Linda and all the rest have to say more than what the little old rabbi has to say. But that's fine. That's television. I don't expect anything more. As for the people in Langley and London and Paris and Jerusalem, they know a hell of a lot. And they have to deal with a hell of a lot more than you want to know. More than they want to know. But they know they don't have a choice. And that's why things are classic. But I'm opening it up for you, so you know what you choose to do with it. What can I say? I am so confident that only those of you who are going to listen are going to listen, and the rest of you are going to nod your head, and you're going to listen to the next class. I guess you're just not ready. But when the time comes, you will be. You'll listen to this class, and then you'll know which way to go next. And when that happens, we'll see you then. All righty. I'm Ariel Bartzado, Kosher Torah School. Thank you for allowing me to have fun with you tonight. Looking forward to seeing you in our next class. God bless y'all. Shalom.